A lot of people are looking to insulate their old basements. However, you have to nail your moisture management details before you even think about insulating. Otherwise, you could easily see the rapid degradation of the structure. Last time we talked about how to address drainage and waterproofing when remodeling existing basements, as well as all the sources of moisture that we have to be concerned about. If you haven't watched that video, we'll put a link to it up here, but insulating and air sealing an old basement can often pose a challenge and has led to a lot of confusion about which strategies actually work and which will increase your risks of failure. In this video, we're talking about how to successfully insulate and air seal a basement to control condensation and to ensure that you have a durable, dry, and comfortable home. We're starting where we left off at floor assemblies. There are a lot of ways to insulate an old basement slab, and the strategy that we use to address a basement slab will vary quite a bit on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the condition of the floor slab, whether there are damp spots, and whether a vapor barrier was installed beneath the slab. If we've addressed bulk water intrusion at the walls, and we have a drainage strategy in place, and we're not seeing evidence of any moisture, or if the moisture issues are relatively mild, the slab can simply be coated in a fluid applied epoxy coating that's compatible with the concrete. And there's tons of different formulations, but we want to make sure that the alkalinity of the concrete doesn't compromise the integrity of the epoxy, but that epoxy will cure into a monolithic vapor barrier, an air control layer, and a capillary break, preventing moisture transport and soil gases from the slab to the interior. If we have more severe moisture issues or an uneven floor, we want to use a secondary dimple mat designed for floor applications to uncouple the floor assembly from the damp slab. We've talked about this strategy several times before on this channel, but essentially the dimple mat will provide a capillary break, and the gap created by the dimples will provide a space where vapor pressure can equalize, preventing any further moisture transport inwards, both in the form of vapor and through the capillary transfer of water. Remember, moisture wants to move from higher concentrations to lower concentrations. If the relative humidity within the air gap is 100%, there's nothing driving additional moisture into this space. Again, this only works if the dimple mat is taped and sealed to be airtight. And so this brings us to insulation. How do we insulate an existing basement space safely without the risk of condensation or trapping moisture? We actually have a whole video on the different strategies that can be used to insulate basements successfully, which you can go and watch up here, but we can insulate our basements from the interior or from the exterior using a wide range of different products and strategies, whether we want to use taped rigid foam board, mineral wool, cellulose, spray foam, or any other alternative materials. But the key here is providing a means of condensation control. What this typically means is that we're looking for an insulation material that has a high R value per inch, that's air impermeable, and that has the benefits of a vapor retarder. And that basically translates to either taped rigid foam or closed cell spray foam. We typically recommend using taped rigid foam since we found that spray foam has a tendency to off-gas long after the initial installation, and some of these off-gassing chemicals can be harmful irritants. The rigid insulation should be installed tightly against the dimple mat with adhesives if you're using an internal drainage system, or directly against the foundation wall if you're using an external drainage strategy. And so we simply just need to tape the joints and seams so that we have one continuous monolithic layer. In terms of rigid insulation, you can use EPS, XPS, GPS, or polyiso. All of them work. Just avoid using products that have cellulose fiber facers, since these can degrade and support mold growth. Then we're free to insulate the stud cavities with any unfaced bat or blown-in insulation of our choosing, since we have our condensation control in place. It's critical that we don't apply any impermeable materials like polyethylene vapor barriers over the studs, as this will trap moisture within the wall assembly, and that can cause it to deteriorate relatively quickly. Check out this video up here for more information. We don't need any vapor barriers if we're controlling condensation using these insulation practices. Remember that the rigid insulation or the spray foam is providing the vapor retarder and the air barrier in this assembly. It's better to have no vapor retarder at all than to have one in the wrong place. If we want to use fibrous insulation materials in isolation, like mineral wool, wood fiber, cellulose, and we want to avoid the foam, we have to use a smart vapor retarder membrane to control condensation from air leakage and diffusion, while still allowing for inward drying if moisture finds a path into that cavity. Again, we discussed this strategy in depth in our basement insulation video, as well as in our basement ebook. When we go to insulate the floors, we have several options, but in pretty much every case, we're going to opt for using rigid insulation. If we're using a fluid applied epoxy to provide our capillary break and our our moisture control in the slab, we can simply install the rigid insulation directly above the slab with staggered and offset joints, which will provide the benefits of a thermal break and a secondary capillary break in the event that moisture happens to find a path through the epoxy, as unlikely as it is. 
Now, we can either install sleepers above the rigid insulation layers and a single layer of subflooring. This would be a more traditional strategy. Or we can install two layers of subflooring with staggered and offset joints that are glued and fastened together directly on top of the rigid insulation, where the subfloor is essentially floating. Both strategies work pretty well, but if you want a more compact buildup, the floating floor tends to work best, and you don't have to fuss around with fastening the sleepers to the concrete slab. If you're installing a dimple mat over the existing slab, you pretty much have to use the floating floor strategy, as the fasteners through the sleepers will puncture the dimple mat and compromise its function of vapor pressure equalization. What's nice about the floating floor is that you can install non-load-bearing partitions directly over the subfloor, and in both cases, the rigid foam and the dimple mat have substantial compressive strength to support partitions. Load-bearing walls do need to be planned out, and that's where we would have a transition from the dimple mat or the floating floor to a little expansion gap that's air-sealed. We also have to make sure that the rim joist connection is properly air sealed and insulated to prevent condensation. Here we have a bunch of different building components intersecting at this one location between the foundation wall, the mud sill, the floor joist, the exterior sheathing, the subfloor. A lot is going on here and we need to make sure that we're preventing air leakage that could result in moisture accumulation as this often leads to mold and rot. We also have a whole video breaking down how to insulate rim joists using a variety of different strategies, but essentially our options are either to install rigid foam between each floor joist and seal that rigid foam with either an expanding foam sealant or an elastomeric joint and seam filler. We can apply closed cell spray foam to that cavity, but again, we have to deal with the potential off-gassing issues. We can address condensation from the exterior using rigid insulation applied at the right ratio relative to the climate zone and do a good job about air sealing the exterior connection, which we should be doing anyways or we can use a smart vapor retarder membrane and tape that to each floor joist. Now, something that you'll need to keep in mind is that if the mud sill has been installed directly on top of the foundation wall without a capillary break, this will have an impact on how we address this building condition, as we're gonna have a lot more moisture transferring from the foundation wall to that mud sill and any other wooden components that are in direct contact. We may wanna shift over to an exterior insulation strategy on the exterior walls to keep those wooden components warmer and closer to interior conditions. Another strategy that we can use is to install borate rods at regular intervals into the mud sill or any embedded components. Borate rods are essentially composed of borate salts that help to preserve the wood and deter rot fungi, as well as bugs, and will help to drive any moisture out of the wood as it leaches out. Borate rods are often used in log home construction to help preserve those components, but we can also use them for this type of application. Now, it's really important that you inspect the condition of the mud sill and any embedded components, as you'll sometimes find that they're either in really good condition or they've already started to deteriorate. And if they're already deteriorated or in the process of deteriorating, they need to be replaced. You don't want that rot fungi spreading to other parts of the building. That about sums up the fundamentals of basement retrofits and managing moisture, air sealing, and insulating. A few other things that you may want to keep in mind. You want to make sure that you have a dedicated dehumidifier in your basement space in the event that you have moisture drying to the interior or if you have hot humid air leaking in and potentially coming into contact with materials and surfaces. We also don't want to apply any impermeable finishes on our basement walls since that will impact the inward drying potential. Things like vinyl wallpaper, PVC shiplap, or plastic panels that aren't vacuum should be avoided completely. In order to get the best durability out of our basement walls, we need to make sure that we're allowing our moisture sensitive components to dry out. Guys, if you found this helpful, I'd really recommend picking up our design guide to dry and comfortable basements. We cover all of these topics in depth and talk about a whole lot more that you need to be thinking about, as well as specific waterproofing systems and products, insulation strategies and construction details for both new and existing buildings, niche building conditions, window assemblies, air sealing, and so much more. Again, that's only available at a Siri designs.com slash shop. Links to those will be in the description below. We also have a ton of free articles on our website, which also cover many aspects of basement design and common issues. Go ahead and leave a like if you haven't already, and subscribe for more weekly building science videos. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers.